In this video, we'll start getting into section 4.2 and start formally discussing what we call the definite integral. Now, we've had a few sections where 3.9, we discussed the idea of the antiderivative, then 4.1, we start talking about area under the curve. This starts to connect the ideas a little bit more, and then in 4.3, we'll talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus, and that will be a big section in tying all these ideas together. So, right off the bat, what do we call, what is the definite integral? Well, for notation, we use this integral symbol, that S that we talked about a little bit back, and that's gonna be our integral symbol. And we'll have that integral of f of x dx, and then we'll have these bounds, an A on the bottom and a B on the top. Now, that is the notation, and that is what we will call the formally the definite integral the integral of f of x dx from x equals a to x equals b. All of that is formally defined based on the area under the curve work that we were doing on 4.1. That when we were doing those left and right endpoint sums, that we had that set up of one of them would give us an underestimate and the other would give us an overestimate and the more rectangles, the bigger N was, the closer we got to the actual area under the curve. Well, here, we're going to incorporate that. We're still gonna have that idea of the summation, and I'm gonna have an F of X sub I, delta X, and I'm still gonna have I go from one to N. Formally, that was the right endpoint formula. For the left endpoint, we had X sub I minus one, but it doesn't matter because as you take the limit as n approaches infinity, now you're essentially cutting an infinite number of rectangles. So left endpoint, right endpoint, it doesn't matter. Now we will get the exact area under the curve. So I want to come back to this formal definition in just a moment. And for those who go into Calc 2, you'll see this come up a little bit more that there'll be other definite integrals you look at, but those integrals will always start as this infinite summation. By the way, a quick little aside, why do we use this S symbol here? Well, that S symbol originated because it came from this idea of a summation. So we use the capital sigma for summation, but they used S for this idea. This completely connects the idea of integration to the idea of area under the curve, because that's exactly what we were doing here. But this also makes that connection with the idea of total, the total of something. And we'll see some more of that as we go forward. So a couple of quick little things. So that's the formal definition. This idea is also called a Riemann sum. Riemann is a very famous mathematician. He's done a lot of work in a lot of different areas, some of which were very calculus-based. So this idea is kind of named after him. So if you ever hear that idea of a Riemann sum, it just goes to the idea of, that, of those rectangles, the area under the curve. So now, now let's again point out how this works. So if I had, here's some curve, and I want the area from A to B, and that's the area we're looking for. And we kept going through the whole left endpoint and right endpoint. But as N goes to infinity, that essentially, I'm cutting an infinite number of rectangles here. So and that, now, obviously, I can't make an infinite number of rectangles. But just what I was doing, just all those little slash lines. And by the way, in your book, both in section 4.1, they showed some of this with an actual number like 10 rectangles, 30 rectangles, 50 rectangles. And those are some very good pictures to try and show how close those area sums came to the actual area under the curve. But now with this idea of an infinite number, and there's a few pictures like this in 4.2 as well, that when you do this infinitely, there is no room to go left or right. That every single one of these, it's like, well, is this left sum, right sum? Well, the fatness of my pen is making that irrelevant. So again, that's why over here, we could have done this exact same thing with the left endpoint formula instead of the right, but it's just a little easier to use the I versus the I minus one. 
But now we make the biggest connection here, everyone. So this is the formal definition, and this connects the dots. But what we really need going forward is to make this connection, that the definite integral of f of x dx from a to b is equal to the area under the curve f of x. Remember that whole idea, area under the curve, it's from the curve to the x-axis. So even though we always say under, again, we kind of think of this picture, but if my curve was down here, it would be the area up to the x-axis. But specifically, area under the curve f of x from x equal a to x equals b. If you read in the book, the book sticks in a little bit more about the formality, that how does this work? Well, you can't have too many discontinuities. If this shoots off, you know, does the area even make sense? If you got a piece of graph up here, then you jump and you got another piece down here. So there's a few little things that we'll formally add into this as we go on, particularly in section 4.3, but not to get lost in those details. Some of those details, they remind us that delta x is still that b minus a divided by n that we set up in the previous section. So all those things to really get this idea. So the definite integral, again, the big picture, the definite integral is the area under the curve. So we're starting to make that connection. Integration to area. We've already seen a little bit how area leads to that sense of total. And again, 4.3, we'll see how the antiderivative fits in this as well. So we've covered all the big things, everybody. Now I want to do a few problems. I want to establish some properties now that we have this set up. And that'll wrap up section 4.2. The book goes a little deeper here. The book has some extra information so that you can start to use this idea. They give you some different summation information so that you could find these summations and take the limit as n approaches infinity. They're not bad problems. They're certainly, you know, they're kind of like the initial bit with the derivative that when we were trying to use the limit definition, but here we're trying to speed this up just a little bit to get to the idea of the shortcuts. So again, few places, certainly we could realize that limit would give us this exact area. But again, as I do a few problems, you'll realize it's just the area and some basic aspects of geometry that we're going to need. So let's evaluate. A lot of information here. So now let's start to see a problem to see what I'm talking about. So let's start very basic. Number one, let's evaluate the integral of 4 dx from minus 2 to 5. And by the way, that's commonly how you read this. Some people talk about the integral from a to b of f of x dx, or the integral of f of x from a to b, but in some way it all goes together. And now, from what we were just saying here, how on earth are we supposed to know this? Well, this entirely depends on understanding of geometry. That here my function would be the simple y equals 4. And if y equals 4, well, we know what that graph looks like. 1, 2, 3, 4, that would just be a horizontal line, always equaling the y value of 4. And I want the area under this curve from x is negative 2 to, to x is 5. So I'm looking for this area. But that's why this first problem is kind of nice and neat. This first problem, this curve was simple enough in that it was such a nice flat straight line that when we actually look at the area we're looking for, hopefully we realize we're just looking at a rectangle. So area of a rectangle, base times height. And notice everybody, this is not the approximates. This was not when making rectangles inside of a curve. This just is literally a rectangle. So this is not approximately or an over or under estimate for this area. This rectangle exactly represents the area we're looking for. So I'm just gonna do a little base times height. The height of this is four because we went from the x-axis to y equals 4, so that's always a distance of 4. The base, well, that's a total of 7. 
I definitely wanted to include a little bit of negative x value here to show you the negative x's make no difference. This is all just distance. And still, even with that setup of b minus a, that still works. I mean, we could be very literal here. Two units here and five units here gives me that seven total units. But that still kind of fits in with that b minus a, even if a is negative. So now that we've done all of that, it's a nice simple rectangle. Base is seven, height is four. So that makes this integral equal to the value of 28. And these are generic problems, so we don't have any units here. If these were just basic measurements, inches and inches, well, that would be square inches. We've already seen the concepts of total, that if this measures something as a rate and this is a time, so maybe, if again, we talk about uh, how much air we breathe and we're talking about cubic meters per hour, the rate we're breathing, and this represents hours, then that would be the total amount of air that we breathe in cubic meters. So the units can seem a little silly if this is miles per hour and hours, that this area would just represent total miles. But again, we'll get more to the totals a little bit later. Right now, we're definitely focusing on the area connection. Okay, so not a bad first problem. Let's, let's do another. They can get a little harder than that, certainly. So let's look at number two, and let's look at the function 2x plus 1 dx, and in this one, let's go from 0 to 3. Now again, everybody, we don't have any tools yet. So the only thing we have is this basic definition. And notice, I'm not even looking at this definition. I'm really just going to the actual literal understanding of area under the curve. So again, I'm not giving you a problem you can't solve yet. There must be a way we can handle this. And the way is similar to this one. Now my f of x is a little more complicated. Now I'm getting a 2x plus 1. But y equals 2x plus 1. That's still just a straight line. It's not a horizontal line. Now we've got a slope of positive 2. So I'll draw a quick picture again. My b is 1, so I'm starting at a y-intercept uh, of 1. The slope of positive 2, something like that would be my line. And I want the area from 0 to 3. So 0, well, that's the y-axis, to 3. Now, careful, everyone. It's very easy that people just start trapping regions, but we have to pay attention to the bounds. I'm not looking at this triangle this time. This little region right here, I don't care about. I'm only going from zero to three, so this is my region. I'm not getting this little section, but I am getting all of this. So initially, this looks a little ugly, but it's still a known geometric shape. It's a trapezoid. Now, a lot of us don't remember the area of a trapezoid, so let's just take a slightly different approach. A trapezoid can be broken into rectangles and triangles, so let's do that here. I'm just going, and again, I'm not doing left sum, right sum. I'm just trying to make this nice geometric picture. So if I just take a horizontal line right here, now this bottom section, this is a nice little rectangle, and then this upper section, this is a nice right triangle. So let me find the area of both of these and add them together, and that will be the total area under the curve. So still using area and reminding ourselves of a lot of geometric principles, area of this piece plus area of this piece, the area of the two pieces combined will give me the area of the whole. Okay, so the rectangle will very similar how we did this one, from zero to three, the base is three, well, what about the height? Well, this was y equals 1, so that distance is 1. So that area would just be 3, 3 times 1. Okay, well, what about the triangle up here? Well, the base still is 3. This distance here is still the same as this distance here, so I've still got a base of 3. But what about the height? Over here, remember for triangles, one-half base times height, and in a right triangle, this side can represent the base and this side can represent the height. So how am I supposed to find this? Well, if I did a really good job drawing my picture, 
I could figure that out by using my scale and looking at Y's. But without that, take advantage of this. And this is a little similar to the left sum, right sums. Look at what's going on here. That if I look at the Y value right here, the Y when X is three, we'll plug that in, two times three plus one is seven. A coincidence, right? That seven was up here. This is a different seven. But here to here is seven, but our height only goes from here to here. So, well, if this is one and the whole thing is seven, that means that side is only length six. So now when I do my one half base times height, I would get one half three times six. So the area of the triangle would be nine and therefore the total area under the curve would be 12. The rectangle had area three, the triangle area nine. So adding those together gives me a final area of 12. Okay, one more like this. I don't want to get too hung up on this section, everybody. This is nice, but I, I'm telling you, I've already mentioned 4.3. We're going to get some much more concrete ideas. These first couple of problems, and even number three I'm going to do, they have to give us some nice geometric shapes for us to take this approach. So let's do one more like that. But again, just to realize, we will get more practice and more techniques just in the next video in the section 4.3 section. So number three, let's take a look at the integral from minus four to four of the square root of 16 minus x squared dx. So when we do this, same idea, but now I'm really starting to get something a little weird because the previous two, as soon as I wrote y equals here, Again, just a little jog your memory. Y equals a number, the horizontal line. Y equals MX plus B, giving me a sloped line. But now, if I just think of Y equals the square root of 16 minus X squared, I don't think many of us have a very good picture of what that might look like. So let me just take a second and manipulate this. I'm going to square both sides. You may not understand why I'm doing that, but just give me a moment, you'll see. I square both sides, I get y squared, squaring a square root cancels, so I get 16 minus x squared, and I'm going to add the x squared to both sides. Does that equation look more familiar? Hopefully, but if you forget, that's the equation of a circle. A circle centered at the origin, there's no extra terms here, so just the x squared plus y squared, my center is the origin, and that's r squared. So this would be a circle centered at the origin, radius four. But wait a second, let's go backwards though. So this gives me a full circle. So how is that trying to tell me about this? If I go backwards, start here and solve for y, well, I'd subtract the x squared over. I take a square root of both sides, but when I take the square root, I'd have a plus or minus here. So the plus or minus the square root of 16 minus x squared would be the same as this, would be the whole circle. We only have the plus. We're only getting the top half of our circle. So we are getting a semicircle. We are getting the top half of a circle of radius 4. So that is what we are looking for. From minus four to four, well, four units to the left, four units to the right, I'm getting the edges of the circle that way, and that's the picture. All the way around would be this, but this would just be the top half. So the area of the whole circle, well, area is pi r squared, radius was four, so the area of the whole circle would be 16 pi. We're only looking at half that circle, this would have an answer of eight pi. Okay, so now let's get a little deeper into the properties. So now on page two, let's draw another generic picture to try and establish a few more ideas to get a few more pieces of clarity here. So here's my function. Let's look, function does this. And I'm not trying to draw sine. Let's, let's have that go down here. And this one also will just go down. So there is some function. 
Now, how do we handle different regions? When we have this as our initial definition, that by following this basic idea, the y values would be positive, and that formula for delta x would be positive. So in this perfect scenario, areas would be positive. Well, what happens in other areas? Well, part of the reason I wanted to show you this was to realize that negative x's have no bearing on this. Just because the x's were negative here, that meant nothing. There was nothing extra to consider there. All this was still above the x-axis, whether we are over here or over here. So there was nothing different. There was no new way to treat anything. So if I wanted the area in this function from maybe say here to here, even though most of that region or all of that region has negative x's, that would still give me a traditional positive area. But what if I'm below the x-axis? Well, now following that formula, now we'll be using these y's, and these y's would be negative. So all it boils down to, everyone, is just simply this. If your area is above the x-axis, then that area is positive. If your area, so that's, I'll call that point number one. Point number two, if your area is below the x-axis, like we are right here, then that area is negative. But what if your region is both above and below? Well, let's just take a quick second to think about this. And this is something I was trying to get you to think about on the previous page as well. So let me just draw you another quick little generic, generic scenario. So here's some function, and I want the area from here to here. But let's pretend I already know the area from here to here is 2, and the area from here to here is 5. What would that total area equal? Well, again, this is just what I was trying to point out in this picture. In this one, I'm setting up two areas left and right, but if I know each of the pieces, regardless if one is smaller and the other is bigger, but if I know each of the pieces, I could add those pieces together to get the total area. So here, 2 plus 5 was 7, similar to the way in this one, the 3 plus 9 gave us the 12. So that's a concept that we can always use with area. And in the two examples I've shown you, I've kind of been... You know, I've shown you nicer pieces, I guess is what I should say. But that idea applies in any situation. So here's my last point. If my area is both above and below the x-axis, does that end up being positive or negative? Well, the answer is really it depends. So if I wanted, let's go back to this picture now, and let's look at this as A1, the area from here to here. We'll keep it easy. I'll use the x-intercepts as boundaries here. So if I go here to here, everything is clearly below the x-axis, so that'll be a negative area. And if I call this one area 2, going from here to here, well, everything here is clearly above the x-axis, so that is positive. So what if I want the area from here to here? I'll still do the same thing we did here. I'll still add the areas, but add is a little bit of a loose term. Let's stick some numbers in now. So let's say area one equals negative four and area two equals positive 11. Okay, what would this total area be? This total area, I would still do a1 plus a2, but that would really become minus 4 plus 11. So I still get 7 the same way I did here, but for different reasons. Here, this literally added to 7. Here, we subtracted. So this is the idea of the net area. That's kind of the way it's working out. So in this case, this total area came out to be positive. Not that it'll always happen like that. It came out to be positive because the area above the curve was bigger, was larger than the area below the curve. If I wanted the area from here to say here, 
Now, this is still all negative. This little region is above and be positive, but maybe this little area is only an area of one. So now the area from here to here would be negative three. Minus four plus one would give me that negative three. So when we're looking for regions that are both above and below, we can't be guaranteed to get positive or negative. It's more about where most of the area is. So if we clearly know we're above, we know it's positive. If we know we're below, it's definitely negative. But if we're both, well, we kind of have to know which is bigger, the area above or the area below. All right. And now let's take this and let's formally establish some properties. These properties, they're a little scattered in section 4.2. And the, the book may nitpick on a few extras. I'm trying to put the ones that we need to get out of this and that we will use. Even as we get better ideas in 4.3, you'll still see some different problems that test you on your understanding of these properties. So properties of the definite integral. Number one, I'm not, there's no special order here. I'm just trying to get all these properties and give you a quick little discussion. And then we'll wrap up this section with a few problems that test you on these properties. So again, everybody, this is a very important section. Establishing the definition of the definite integral is important and making that connection to area. That's the big highlight from this section. So there's other pieces, especially for people who go a little deeper, not just into Calc 2, but into higher level math. There's some good things worth reading, but nothing to get too obsessed over. You're seeing the main components you need to move forward. Okay, so property number one. If I want the definite integral from A to C, I can get that by taking the definite integral from A to B, and adding it to the definite integral from B to C. That may look very fancy, but realize we keep using that idea. So let me point it out right here, that if this X value is A and this X value is C, well, this first integral is trying to get you to get the total region under the curve from here to here. But how can we do that? Well, if B is some value between A and C, I can find this small piece from A to B, and then this bigger piece from B to C, and by adding them together, I get this total area. Do we see that's exactly what this formula is giving us? So that formula looks a little confusing, but it exactly matches up this description. One piece plus the other piece gives you the total area. Some books even write a follow-up that you could also do things like you can get this integral by taking the total area minus this piece, but that's just a little algebraic manipulation, right? If A equals B plus C, then B equals A minus C. You could always play games like that. And even in the big picture, we've used that. If I knew the total area was seven and I knew this chunk was five, well, seven minus five can get me to this region that has area two. So a lot of nice little flexibility. And as long as we're understanding the area ideas, now hopefully that formula should make a lot of sense. The next two are interesting, but they're, uh, I'm sorry, three and four are interesting. Number two has its own little piece. Number two initially looks weird. Just writing the formula first, if we have the integral a to b of f of x dx, that is equal to negative the integral from b to a, f of x dx. And initially, that can look very confusing. What actually happened here? And notice, it's all about the bounds. That when we did this initial definition, that we already started with the assumption that a is to the left of b. So all the delta x formula was based off of that, that it was b minus a divided by n. So that again, when we were doing this, that we had a left to right orientation. And that is really what established the area above the x-axis is positive and what's below is negative. But now, you don't can't quite understand why this could happen right now. But for some reasons, these bounds can get out of order. 
that we want to go from left to right as we go from bottom to top here, but there are situations that'll bounce us out of order. So if these are out of order, we'd get the same area, but by getting the opposite order, we get the negative. Just like area above is positive and area below is negative, if you go from left to right, you get a positive, but if you go from right to left, you get a negative. So that's kind of our way. And to be honest, the more common way this would get used, I will put this in our quick problems coming up just to get a little experience. But what will be more common is if we end up getting an integral that's out of order, we'll put it back in order by taking that extra negative. It would be like we start here with this being positive, so we'll put the negative over here by putting these back in order. That'll be the more common way. Okay, number three, this is where we have special properties. If we know our f of x function is an even function, this goes back to properties of symmetry. So if I know my function f of x is even, then the integral from minus a to a, this is the second important point. This is why this is gonna be a property. You'll see this has a much more special situation that this can help. But if f is even, well, that's already a big assumption. Even functions are not super common. But the second part is to notice this is not a generic a to b anymore, that we're going from negative a to positive a. That however far we're looking to the left from x is 0, we're going that same distance to the right. So now let's just think about this for a moment. And again, let's visualize with a picture. That would be an even function. And if I wanted the region, the area from negative A to positive A, well, my final rule, I should give myself a tiny bit of room. Here's your conclusion. This integral equals, well, notice what happens here. If this is an even function, I have symmetry across the y-axis. Therefore, the area to the left of the y-axis is the exact carbon copy as the area to the right. So this is a tiny little advantage that if we notice this exact situation, that this integral would be twice the integral just going from zero to A. This, again, it's not super helpful, but just go back to this problem. And we could have taken advantage of this here, that this circle is symmetric. So instead of finding the area from here to here directly, I could have found the area of one quarter of the circle and then doubled it to get this piece as well. Again, that really wasn't very helpful in this particular problem because we still had to figure out this was a circle. But again, just a little application of what we're seeing from this. So still sticking with this, if f is even, this special integral equals this. If my f function is odd, now this one is even better. Now I'm still looking at this, but now if my function is odd, something like this would be odd. So I'd be looking at from negative a to positive a. So I'd want that area. But do we notice, be way better than what we're getting here, this area, the idea of being odd, this symmetry across the origin, that what happens up here on the upper right is the exact opposite down here on the lower left. So meaning this area that's above the x-axis that's positive would be completely matched by this area that's below the x-axis and is negative. So for this one, we're still getting then this, but now our conclusion is that equals zero. So that's definitely nice and helpful. And now my last two properties. Let me just move to the next page, and then we'll finish up with the properties. So page three, but continuing my properties, we have property four. This one, not quite, it's not as easy to understand until we make the last connection, but it's worth bringing up right here that we will eventually get back to the idea of antiderivatives. 
And when we have antiderivatives, the most ideal situation is when these are connected by addition subtraction, we get to take the antiderivative of each piece separately. And that's exactly the same thing that happens in a definite integral. That this total area would be the same as finding the area just under f from a to b, and then appropriately adding or subtracting to the, <clears throat> to the area under g from a to b. But of course, we need to keep those same bounds a to b. And finally, number five, if I have the integral from a to b, and I get an extra multiplier c inside of here, well, same thing. With derivatives, antiderivatives, that multiplier pushes along, and the same thing happens here. We could essentially pull that multiplier out and then look at the area under the f of x from a to b, find that area, and then still multiply by c. So how do I use these properties? Well, let's again, let's just get a couple of problems to demonstrate the use. So first thing, I'm going to give you some information. We are given the integral of f of x from minus 1 to 3 equals 10. We are also given the integral of f of x from 3 to 5 is 4. And last, we are given the integral of g of x from minus 1 to 3 is 6. So all this is given, and I'm reading them as integrals. I also reminded you the ideas of area. They're all the same here, but all this was given, and now here's our first problem. Let's evaluate, and for number one, let's evaluate the integral of f of x from minus one to five. And this is one that we keep coming back to. If we understand these ideas as area, then we completely understand what's happening here. I want the area under f from minus one to five, but how am I supposed to find that? Well, this is telling me, I'm sorry, right here. So I want the area under f, I'm just drawing a crazy picture. I have no idea what this looks like. So just to draw something, and I want it from minus one to five. That's what we're looking for here. Well, how am I supposed to do that? I have no idea what this curve is. This is a generic picture. We'll use the given information. I know the area under f from minus one to three, that all of this would equal 10. And this tells me the area from three to five, from here to here would be four. So what's the total area from here to here? That would be 14. So I could just think of it that way. But others really, again, were leaning on the properties, so they would write this equal. I'm going to be very quick. This would just be from minus 1 to 3 of f plus the integral from 3 to 5 of f. And whether you drew the picture or you think of it as the formula, you're still ending up in the same spot. The way to get this answer is to understand either through formula, through property, or through concept how this information can get you to here. Okay, let's move right into number two then. Number two, let's look at the integral of f of x from five to three. And this is one that once again, if we just see, well wait, that is awfully similar to this. Oh, my bounds are out of order. So we just remember that property that we put the bounds in order by flipping the sign and that would just give us a negative four for this answer and we're done. But others again, just quickly pointing it out through the formulas. So this would be, if you wanna be very literal here from B to A, so you would get it to be from A to B with the extra negative sign. So there's the negative sign and we know the integral of F from three to five is four. I hope you notice, 
I'm trying to be very formal up here in how I'm writing because this was given information. But for a lot of quick notes, a lot of people can drop the F of X, the DX. We'll get back to how important the DX really is in this notation. But for a lot of people, these quick write-ups, it's okay to, as long as keep your function, keep your proper bounds. That's enough and that people can understand the work you're setting up. Okay, two more, everybody. Actually, let's do three more. Number three, let's look at the integral of f of x minus g of x from, from minus one to three. Okay, everybody, some people, you just want to be very, very literal in how you plug these situations in, how you treat these things. So, okay, a property, well, this will be the integral of f minus the integral of g. But others see that quickly enough and just start to get to work. That the integral of f is 10 minus the integral of g is six. So this would give us a final answer of four. Number four will also be fairly quick and simple. Let's look at the integral from minus one to three of five gx dx. Well, this looks very similar to this one, but it just has the extra five. There's one big thing I should have said right at the beginning here, everyone. Notice when I'm using these facts, I'm not plugging the 10 in for f. I'm plugging the 10 in for the entire integral of f. Even go back to this one. There's a huge difference between saying the integral equals four or the integral of four. So the integral of four ended up being this other number 28 because of all these other ideas. So again, just be careful, everybody. Don't end up with the integral of 10 plus four. That's a mistake. So same idea here. Now all of a sudden people just say this is the integral of 30 because they just stick the six in place for the G and then five times six is 30. But what we have to do here is the five gets pulled out. And now all of this gets replaced with the six. It's not G is six, it's the integral of G from minus one to three equals six. So now I can get five times six. So I don't get the integral of 30 at the end, I just get an answer of 30. And last one, everybody. Number five, let's look at the integral from minus one to three of two f of x plus seven gx. And if you wanna do it in two steps, some people can see it a little bit quicker, but in, uh, essentially this is where I'm gonna go. I'm gonna use both of the last properties. Technically first I'm breaking up the addition and then I can kick these extra multipliers out in front so I'll end up with two integral f of x dx plus seven integral from minus one to three of g dx. That's formally where I'm going, but just to realize some people it's two steps, integral of two f plus the integral of seven g, and then you're pulling out the two and the seven. And again, I should at least keep my bounds. We mentioned a while back, without the bounds, we call that an indefinite integral, and that'll come up again in section 4.4. .4. So definitely, again, short notation, it's fine to just write f for g and to drop the dx if you're doing some quick notation, but you certainly want to still keep the bounds. So now we've got all this figured out. So 2 times f, so 2 times 10, plus 7 times 6, 20 plus 42, will give us 62 for that final answer.